Good day, everybody. Today we're going to look at an interesting result, what I find pretty interesting and quite unexpected, and we'll relate that to a popular constant and an integral. So the result is we're going to take positive integers, eventually kind of every positive integer, but let's start with some small ones first. And we're going to divide each integer by every positive integer that's less than or equal to that integer. So for 5, you divide 5 by 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And then we get these five numbers. And we're going to see how far away each of these results is from the next integer that's um, greater than or equal to our result. So if you're at an integer, the next integer that's greater than or equal to is, well, the one that's equal to. So uh, 5 is 0 away from the next integer that's bigger than or equal to. 2.5 is 0.5 away from the next integer up. Uh, 1 and 2 thirds is 1 third away from the next integer up. 1.25 is 0.75 away from the next integer bigger than or equal to, and then 1 is 0 away. So we get those five numbers, we average them, and we get some result. And we're going to do that with all the numbers, right? So if I do it with 4, 4 divided by 1 is, a, is an integer, 4 divided by 2 is an integer, 4 divided by 3 is 4 thirds. So that's 2 thirds away from the next integer up, and 4 divided by 4 is 1, so these other three values were all zeros. The average is uh, 1 sixth. So we've got those values here. So I'm, I'm making a table, and you can do it with 3 and 2 and 1, kind of trivial, but uh, there's our results so far. Look at a couple more. So again, if I do it with n equals 6, 6 divided by 1 is an integer, 6 divided by 2 is an integer, 6 divided by 3 is an integer, 6 divided by 4, 3 halves are 1.5, 6 divided by 5, 1.2, 6 divided by 6. So each integer is 0 away from the next integer that's greater than or equal to it, and 1.5 is 0.5 away, 1.2 is 0.8 away from the next integer bigger than or equal to. Average of these six numbers is that value. Again, similarly for 7, we get these values, which I also have uh, on the Excel spreadsheet. If I average, I get this. So the result that I found interesting is that th as you do larger and larger n, this average is going to converge. So it's not going to fluctuate. I mean, well, it'll fluctuate some, but it's always going to be fluctuate you know, within a tight, tighter and tighter bound. Right? So it can't deviate. And it converges to a number bigger than 0.5. So here's a larger table. I keep going down. Um, up through the first 12 entries, I've got the full number of columns. And again, you can divide. Of course, 12 has a lot of divisors. And here's the average. So um, it looks like you know they're, oh, it's always point, under 0.5. Actually, 13 would have been the first value where it's above 0.5, but I didn't list that one. And then I, I put some larger ones, and uh, again, this fluctuation. But you can see with these values, that, you know, I just randomly chose. I mean, they're tight on 0.577, and that's what it's going to converge to, this constant gamma, which is approximated right there. So I can also graph those sequence of numbers, which is um, technically when you round up to the next integer greater than or equal to, we call that the ceiling function. So the ceiling function minus the actual uh, number. I, I want to add those up and divide by the total number of numbers. So that would give me my average. So this is the plot of the first 100. And um, it seems like it's always in the range of gamma, as we say, then plus or minus 1 over root n. So mostly under, but occasionally over. I can do higher values. 
So here's from 100 to 200. And again, it's within gamma plus or minus one over root n. Here we are from 200 to 300. Again, within gamma plus or minus one over root n, every value. Here we are from 1,000 to 1,100. And it's going to get tighter and tighter, closer to gamma. Takes a long time to plot. Uh, here, if I just do it individually, this still takes a long time. But there's n equals a million and one. And compared to one over root n, definitely within. And to look into gamma, we're going to look at its definition. I'll start with this uh, graph of first the sum of the reciprocals of the first five integers. So one plus one half plus one third plus one fourth. We can think of this as the area under the step function. So if you graph one over x, then right here, the y value is one. The base is always one, so this would be a square. Uh, this is at one half, so that's the height, one half base is one, so this has area one half. This is at one third, so that would be the height, base is one, so area is one third. This is at one fourth and one fifth, so um, this area represents that sum. Here is the actual definition of gamma. This uh, that harmonic series, but minus log m. So harmonic series diverges, but if you subtract the log of m, then what remains will uh, converge to a constant we call gamma. And I'm, I'm going to look at two or, or a similar uh, sequence of numbers. Think of each m giving you a number. We'll think of this as a sequence of numbers. So this sequence converges to gamma by definition. Well, we have to show it converges to gamma, but uh, this is the definition. And if instead I subtract m plus 1, uh, then it'll converge to the same thing. You can compare the two. Obviously, this one's a little smaller. I'm subtracting a bigger number. So um, this minus this for each m will be positive. And if you do the subtraction, the sum part cancels. So I'm just left with positive log m plus 1 minus log m. Subtraction on the outside is division on the inside. Log of m plus 1 over m applies to this, which is less than or equal to 1 over m. So um, if this converges, then so does this to the same limit. So here's a look at if I um, do sum of 1 over k k equals 1 to m minus log of m plus 1. So it's that same sum, 1 of 5 I had, but now if I subtract log 6, then I just have these five areas. And if you slide them over, you get this. And then the bigger m is, the more areas you're going to have, you're going to slide them over. They would all fit inside the unit square. So you can kind of see you have an increasing sequence. It's bounded by 1, obviously. So it must converge, and uh, it'll converge to gamma. And we also have this inequality. Since we're increasing towards gamma, we're always less than gamma for any finite m. And you can see that we're also more than um, gamma minus this area, which is gamma minus 1 over m plus 1, right? The height would be m plus 1 of where the next one's going to go. So gamma minus 1 over m plus 1 is a lower bound for this partial amount. And then, which, but that's always less than gamma, which would be going to infinity and filling it in. And here's with the definition. With the definition, you don't subtract log of m plus 1. You subtract the log of m. So if I take some 1 over 5, again, it looks like this and subtract log 5 now instead of log 6. So before I subtracted out log 6, took out everything, but now I'm only taking out log 5. Then it looks like this. But you can still slide everything to the left and see you're bounded by 1 
Although now we're actually decreasing as we keep going to the right, like like the if I only did k equals one, it would be one minus log one, log one zero. So it'd be this full square. And then at k equals two, it'd be one plus one half, but then minus log two, so minus this area. Anyway, so um, the extra amount here is getting smaller as m increases. So we're decreasing 2 gamma. So for any finite m, we're above gamma, but we're less than gamma plus 1 over m. All right, if you do 1 over m, obviously that's more than if you keep sliding all the ones we're going to get over to the left. This obviously overestimates. All right, so let's look at how we will prove our result. Again, what we were looking at was um, dividing any given integer by every integer that's less than or equal to it, like computing the ceiling function and subtracting the actual result of the division, averaging those values. So the way we'll, we will do that is we're going to define this function to be 1 over x, the ceiling of 1 over x, I should say, minus 1 over x, and a little trouble at x equals 0, so let's be rigorous here and just do it for x greater than 0, and we'll say the function 0 for x equals 0 and smaller, although we're not going to worry about that. We're only integrating from 0 to 1 anyway. So our function is bounded from 0 to 1 for all x, right? You can't be more than 1 away from the next integer up. In fact, it's actually strictly less than 1, but I just put the less than or equal to anyway. There's also a uh, countable number of discontinuities. So the function's bounded with a countable number of discontinuities. Uh, so that kind of guarantees it is Riemann integral integrable. And we will use that. So if we look at the integral of 0 to 1 of this function, I'm going to break it up first from 0 to 1 half plus 1 half to 1. And we can't argue with this. And on this interval, well, let, let's put in the rule for the function. We can't argue with that. And now on this interval, 1 over x is um, always between 1 and 2, which means the ceiling is 2. Okay, so for any x from 1 half to 1, obviously at 1 half you get 2, but at say 3 quarters, 1 over 3 quarters is 4 thirds. The ceiling would be 2. So it turns into that integral. If you do the antiderivative and plug in the limits, I'm going to work to get a pattern here. So it would be uh, 2, 1 minus a half. And then the log, we've got log 1 minus log 1 half. Um, so the, for the pattern, um, get a common denominator. So it's 1 half, or no, it's 2 over 2 minus 1 over 2. So 2 minus 1 is 1 all over 2 times 1. Log 1 is 0. This is uh, log 2, right? log of a fraction. You can flip it like so. And so simplifying, we get this. This will be plus 1 and minus log 2. And now I'll take integral 0 to 1 half as the integral 0 to 1 third plus integral 1 third to 1 half. Same thing. And now from 1 third to 1 half, well, I'll put in the rule for the function. And now for every x in this interval, except 1 half, that was an endpoint, but for every other x, the ceiling's going to be 3. So obviously at 1 third, 1 over 1 third is 3, but uh, my 0.4 is in between, so 2 fifths. So 1 over 2 fifths is 5 halves. The ceiling of 5 halves would be ceiling of 2.5 or 3. And similarly for every x in that interval. And so I can compute the integral and uh, plug in my limits. 
again, so it'll be three times the length of the interval, one half minus one third, and then minus uh, log one half minus log three. If we simplify this fraction, it would be three minus two, one divided by three times two. And then we've got minus, this is minus log two, this is plus log three, and then plus those two terms. Distribute the minus, and we get plus log two minus log three, plus those two terms. This is now one half. So cancel the log twos, and we get one plus a half minus log three. And well, we're gonna keep doing that. I'll do it one more time, and then jump to the generalization. So integral zero to one third is integral zero to one fourth, plus integral one fourth to one third of f of x. Here I went ahead and put in the rule for f of x, and then plus what we had before. And then on this interval, the ceiling of one over x will always be four. Right at one fourth, one over one fourth is four. And then for any number in between, like 0 0.3 is in between, which is three tenths. One over three tenths is 10 thirds. The ceiling of that would be four. So we can do our antiderivative, uh, get four x, plug in our limits, It'll be one third minus one fourth minus log x, plug in our limits, log one third minus log one fourth, which is minus log x, plus this, which I have down here. So again, this as a fraction, if you get your common denominator, it'll be four minus three over four times three. So they're one over four times three. Uh, this will be plus log three. Um, this is plus log four, then times that minus is minus log four. Then we have plus one plus a half minus log three. The log threes cancel, and I forgot to put it in the right order, so one more time, put it like that. And so you can kind of see that um, you've got this result here. And th this every line, it was always the integral zero to one of f of x dx. So uh, you can, put in what it'll equal is integral zero to one over m plus one, preferred that for the sum of f of x dx, plus the sum of one over k from one to m minus log of m plus one. All right, so when m is three, I get the result up here. Right? Integral zero to one, when m is three equals this. But you know it, it's true for all m. And well, this we can bound. So this we saw is an increasing sequence, increasing the gamma. So this is always less than or equal to gamma. F of x is bounded by one. It's always between zero and one. So this integral is bounded by one over m plus one. Right, integral of one from zero to one over m plus one. So this is bounded by that, and then this is bounded by gamma. It's increasing the gamma. And then for a lower bound, well, obviously the least this will be is zero, if f is between zero and one. And we saw that this is always more than gamma minus one over m plus one. Uh, quick refresher, right? So for any, for any m, we had this is bounded above by gamma and below by gamma minus one over m plus one. Well, this middle result is f of f of x, so you can just rewrite it this way. So f integral zero to one of f of x is bounded up above and below by gamma plus or minus one over m plus one. For every m, that's true. The only way that can be true is if the integral zero to one of f of x equals gamma. So how does that help us? Well, as I said, it, it, the integral is Riemann integrable. And so we're gonna look at a Riemann sum. Specifically, we'll look at the right-hand sum. So we're integrating from zero to one. We're gonna use n rectangles of equal base size. So the delta x will be one over n. And then the xk is your a, which is zero plus k times delta x, so in the end, your kth x value for the right-hand sum will be k over n. So the, the right-hand sum using n rectangles is 
given by this. And then, well, we know the limit of the Riemann sum will converge to the integral if it's Riemann integrable, which it is. So if I put in the rule for f, it's 1 over x minus ceiling, 1 over x minus 1 over x. So I'll put the xk into that for the rule. Delta x, we see, is 1 over n. Um, and now just simplifying a little, xk is uh, k over n. So put that in for the xk's. Well, we can take the reciprocals. And this is exactly the result of what we're trying to find here. So this converges to gamma as n goes to infinity. Now we don't know how fast it converges. I had reason to believe I could show it was 2 over root n, but when I looked at root n, it, uh, it always seemed within 1 over root n. And maybe you can even get tighter. As, as n gets bigger, it seemed even uh, closer than that. Although 1 over root n does seem pretty reasonable. Here we are at 1,000. So who knows how much better you could possibly get guaranteed. So that's our result. If you take integers, divide them by every possible, well, every positive integer less than or equal to, to that integer, look at that re answer, that number you get, and see how far away you are from the next integer that's greater than or equal to where you're at. Those values are going to converge to a number bigger than one half and specifically gamma. So it's just kind of surprising they converge. All right, enough talk. Hope you enjoyed that fascinating fact. Something to think about for the rest of your day. Thank you. Have a good day.